Hey guys, this is Broxum087 doing part 2 video on how to assemble the RWA Agency Arm Sly Kit. And this video will actually show you how to assemble everything inside the kit, as well as disassembling your Tokyo Marie Glock to assemble everything into the frame. Um, there's only two things here that I will not show you, which is how to make your agency frame. The reason why that is is because this takes quite a long time to do for me. Uh, it took, if you follow me on my Facebook page, it took me a good three to four days to make this and um, I frankly made a couple of mistakes with the cut over here it was a little bit steep and the accelerator cut looks a little bit different compared to the way Agency Arms does it but this is the best I can do um, I use my own stippling iron which I'll try to show you guys later if possible because it's still being cleaned right now it's actually right here being cleaned that's actually what it looks like it's still dirty at the moment because I dipped it in Pegasol uh, the next thing I will not show you is how to do your frame fitment on a garter frame. This is a garter EU frame, you can tell because of the markings. Um, the reason why I cannot show you guys that is because some people are under the impression that you do not need to do any work at all to a garter frame in order to fit a, a slide onto it, which I certainly will not argue with people whether or not they're right or wrong. I won't say any of that, but I'll just let you guys know that I will be doing some work to it. In this case, I'll be leveling out my chassis so that it'll be running a little bit smoother. Otherwise, I actually won't modify any of my internals because I don't need to. Um, and it'll actually be a good demonstration of how your Glock would theoretically function on a completely stock frame. So, uh, let's begin the video. So first up, I'll just take your Glock right over here. This is your Tokyo Murray Glock. Uh, there are a couple parts that are a little bit different over here because this is actually a Tokyo Murray Glock 34 frame with a Tokyo Murray Glock 17 slide. The reason why is because the Glock 34 frame, I actually forgot where I put it. But this is the only stock Murray frame I have. It's virtually the same thing. So make sure your pistol is clear. There's no magazine and all that stuff. Pull your takedown lever, pop the slide off. And because we're in Hong Kong, uh, we like to preserve our hammer springs. I advise you to drop your hammer because it preserves the hammer spring. Um, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. If you live in the United States and you play somewhere that's very, very hot and you use green gas, be wary that you may need a harder hammer spring. Uh, in this case, I won't touch anything. So here's your slide. Basically pull the front part here. and This allows you to get the guide rod out very easily without having to fight this part because this part that this metal structure here tends to stay. Take out the barrel. This is the part that you will need. Put that aside. As for the guide rod and the barrel that you just took out, just toss it aside. You don't need it. Next up is your blowback housing unit. So what you have to do is that you need a screwdriver. You no longer need that screw. You can take off the rear sight while you're at it. Well, you know what, you don't have to, but you can just start taking out the blowback housing unit first. Okay, so it just steps out at that. Um, may I advi I'll tell you right now, if you pull the blowback housing unit out, don't suddenly push it back in. The reason why that is is because if your nozzle spring accidentally comes out, you'll be pushing your blowback housing unit back in, and you could crush your nozzle spring. So once you pull it out, don't suddenly push it back in. Just pull it all the way out. And here's your nozzle spring. You will need this. Put that aside. You do not need the spring, you do not need the blowback housing unit, but you will need this stuff inside this nozzle. Now up to this point, I'll actually have to zoom much closer into the nozzle in order to show you guys how to disassemble it. You do need it. Now this is the part where it's incredibly tricky to do on camera. Um, I normally have to do all this by actually looking at all the holes in the nozzle in order to do all this installation. So you see that screw? Torque it off. It's a very, very tiny screw. Make sure you, you have your, your screw sizes down. So that's this tiny, tiny baby screw. Very, very annoying. And all your nozzle guts, generally speaking, they stay in. Just tap it up. So this is a nozzle you no longer need, although it's nice to keep a spare one. It's not the same as the Guns Modify one. The Guns Modify is a Glock 18 nozzle. It's a Glock 18 nozzle because it's for the RMR cut. So throw away the nozzle or keep in whatever toolbox you want. And uh, these are pretty much the parts that you need. So afterwards, uh, put the rest of your internal nozzle parts away. 
The only parts you need from your original nozzle is the rocket valve spring, the, sh the tiny baby screw that I talked about, and that's about it. And then you can start assembling your nozzle. So, imagine if this was a lighthouse, this goes in like this first. Um, it's worth noting that if you have the original Tokyo Murray rocket valve, if you happen to break this, keep this handy at all times. Because some people have been reporting that this breaks. Um, in my personal opinion, I think it just has to do with you mixing it with a high output valve. That's my personal opinion. But it's nice to keep one handy. I'll be installing the guns and modify one. So, take your spring like that. With that end going in first. I like to lead it in with an Allen key. Because this way I don't have to look inside as much. And that's how it sits inside. You might be able to see it on camera. Next up, take a rocket valve, just put it in like that. And just double check that it can move freely. Just push it and it should bounce right back up like that. Next, take your rocket valve locker. Now, notice the position of where the screw, screw um, hole, hole is. It's not like the 17 nozzle words on the top, uh, words on the, um, on the top side. It's actually on the side. So with that in mind, Find the screw hole on your rocket valve locker and just drop it in on top like that. Okay, so it's in. Now up to this point, uh, this is the part of the video where I always have trouble showing is that you now have to find that screw hole. If you don't find it, you will have a lot of trouble. Now I will have to tilt the nozzle a little bit this way because I actually have to see it with my own eyes this time. So what I'm doing is that I'm using the guide rod to help me hold the rocket valve locker in, in place. And this helps me just hold it in position while I get my other hand ready to install the, the, the tiny baby screw. just torque it in until it's flush. It doesn't need to go too deep. If it goes too deep, what can happen is that it could actually interfere with the movement of the rocket valve. So as I move it right now, let me just double check. So we just finished assembling the Glock 18 nozzle. It's actually very simple. All you need is the rocket valve, rocket valve locker, and that's about it. Uh, the screw you just take from the original, and you need the original rocket valve spring. Um, so yeah, that's the nozzle assembled. Don't worry, we'll test this later on. Uh, make sure the screw is perfectly flush. Uh, we'll do all that testing when I assemble the blowback housing unit. Put this aside. Next, you need to work on your frame. Um, you need to take out your trigger bar, which is not too difficult. So long as you follow this very carefully and don't be too rough with your Glock, you'll be fine. So first, take out your takedown lever. You push this silver leaf spring down, and then while you're pushing it, holding it down, you can move this takedown lever off of your frame. Now next up, you punch out your trigger pin. Do not remove this screw yet, because you don't have to. Now since it's on a brand new frame, the rough side of the pin will be on this side, so you can punch it out like this. Sorry, this might be a little bit loud. So sorry. Okay, so as you can see, that's the rough side of the pin right there. It, was, it comes up fairly easily. Uh, the hardest part is just punching out the, your pin for the first time. Uh, in this case, this Glock has never been taken apart, so that's the reason why. Next, your slide release and your slide release spring comes off. Put that aside. Now, take out that screw. Now, up to this point in the video, Keep your thumb on the chassis, because can you see this spring over here? Now this spring is the trigger return spring. It will fly out if you don't hold it in place, so just put your index finger like that. Just make sure it doesn't come off and fly out in them. So that's your spring. That's your chassis. 
and that's the safety piece. On a Tokyo Marie Glock, this is the functions as the safety. When it's pushed like this, it actually prevents the trigger from moving. That's how the safety works. You can tell this is a 34. Okay, so now you have all the stuff left. It's actually much more simple to deal with. So here, punch out that pin. Then take out the screw on the top. Now up to this point, this is what, this is the slightly tricky part. There is a valve knocker disconnector spring that can fly out. What I recommend you to do is inch the chassis off a little bit just so that you can start moving it. And then as you go higher and higher, move your thumb like that. And then you can take your whole entire chassis out. And now your frame is empty. With the exception with the exception of the magazine release. No. Your trigger bar, it just comes off fairly easily. You just have to maneuver a little bit. Uh, in this case, since it's a 34, the trigger bar does have a slightly different geometry and it looks slightly different. Uh, you can tell because it has a 17 marking. Uh, just to show you guys, uh, this is the original Tokyo Murray uh, trigger bar that you will see if you have a Tokyo Murray Glock 17. This trigger bar that you see here, this is for the 34. But it's essentially more or less the same thing with some minor differences, uh, which we will not talk about today. Now, if you're still holding your chassis, that's what I was trying to, trying to capture. Move this down, wiggle your valve knocker disconnector off, and there's a spring. The reason why you have to do this is because you know you don't you don't want, you don't want to lose this, right? Wait, come on. There we go. So set this all aside. Now all you need is your trigger bar. Okay guys, so up to this point we're assembling the trigger. So um, just to show you guys what the original trigger looks like. Um, in order to extract the trigger bar off the trigger, you need to push this off. Push this pin off. Push it down, and then you can just pull out your trigger bar like that. Uh, in this case, I'm using a Murray trigger bar just because this is a spare trigger bar I happen to have. Might as well use it. But exactly this it's pretty much more or less exactly the same thing. Close enough. Now after you get your trigger bar, this is just this is very very plain and simple. Take your trigger, take the pins that you want. Uh, the kit will come with two screws or two pins. I choose to use pins because it looks a little bit better. And this is the grub screw for the adjustable trigger as well as your safety piece, along with the actuator spring. Now here's the one special thing to note. Um, Normally what happens is that when you buy aftermarket triggers, they normally come with a U-shaped spring to uh, move the trigger safety. But this time, because of the geometry and because of the design of this, they decided to go for a linear spring. So, um, so this is actually how it sits. There's a crevice for it, as you can clearly see. In this case, the reason why mine is staying on is because I actually super glued it. If you choose not to super glue it, it's entirely up to you. I super glue it is because I can hold it like this and it will stay still. So I can show you very easily. So how you assemble this is that the trigger, this return spring, lands on roughly around here. So simply have it in like so, and you'll notice that the whole will align. Afterwards, grab your pin. Simply install. Now it's worth noting that this tri that these trigger pins normally you actually need to tap them in for some odd reason these pins go in very very easily so that's not exactly a good thing because you sort of want these pins to stay still in the future i recommend you to flare open one of the ends of these pins so it will stay into the trigger uh, in this case i haven't done it yet because i'm installing this as if i've done no modifications so that's how the safety gets installed just be very wary that watch out for this pin in the future if you're insecure about it, use the screws. Next, install your trigger bar. Now with the trigger facing forward like that, your trigger bar goes in like this. And same and like before, you just basically have to find the trigger bar and then line the hole. So you see that? I'm trying to find it right now. There we go. You know what? I might flip it the other way. So 
sorry, I'm doing this with the camera right in front of my face. So just give me a moment. There we go. So that's your trigger assembled. Now, after you're not done yet, you have to take your adjustable tr your adjustable um, your grub screw for the adjustable trigger. Sorry, my words failed. And install it in here. Now, it's worth noting that you should use a little bit of blue thread lock. Now, the reason for it is actually quite simple. Um, if you use tunable triggers for a while now, you may notice that after if you use it for a while, you may lose the adjustment that you've made. It's because this grub screw can actually go loose under the cycling speed of your slide. So you should add a tiny bit of thread lock. But in this case, I won't for now. So that's basically your, your trigger assembled. So now that we have everything assembled, uh, let's just install everything now. So up to this point in the video, you're just doing the reverse step, right? So it's actually fairly simple. Just take your chassis. Where did my chassis go? Oh no. There we go. Slip your trigger bar into the chassis. Uh, I put an action ball bearing here just to make things a little bit better. Then take your frame. I'm going to be taking my guard frame. I already added some shims on the lower side, so which I'm not going to show you again for certain reasons because not many people do it and if you try to do it and you do it wrong you'll screw up your frame forever because that actually requires permanent modification of your frame so all I did was install the the pin afterwards grab your screw for the top over here and simply install your screw sorry about that I need to hold the, I need to hold the frame funny I'll take, I couldn't take off my tactical light, by the way. Because, God, I hate my big fingers. And the other modification that I did is on oh my garter frame, is that I have a different ID plate. And I'm also filed down the top side of the hammer, because that comes in contact with the Sploba housing unit a little bit. So that's a good tip for you. Next up, grab your frame. Grab your grab your frame. Wait, let me see where my spring is. Where is my spring? All right, this is my original 34 stuff, so I'll just use this one. Grab this trigger spring. Now, what you do is that starting from this side, hook it in like that. You will notice that the orientation of the spring is now closer to the wall. Up to this point, take your chassis, hook it there, and then move your frame forward while keeping this leaf spring from preventing it from tipping. Okay, so that's properly installed. Sorry if I'm not showing this very clearly because I have to I have to see what I'm doing. It's for it's very difficult to to look. And the garter frame comes with its own screw to screw the chassis into place. You don't have to torque it in too tight. Next, uh, I might as well install my takedown lever while I'm at it. Push your leaf spring down. It's basically the reverse step. Next, grab your slide release with your slide release spring. There will be a slot for it.
inside here that just allows you to slip it in. So the key part is not to let your spring slide off and just have it slip in. You'll notice it'll slip in because it goes in relatively smoothly. Now up to this point, it's all about alignment. So you have to align your, your slide release and your trigger. Can you actually see how that works? So right now you can see that I'm trying to align it by looking at the camera screen, which is too different. Did I just get it? Oh my god, I think I did. So now because I dissemble my stuff all the time, I like to have the smooth side on here. So I will actually be pushing it on the other side. Uh, I have to take those off camera because I have I li literally have to see where I'm going. Otherwise, I might damage my slide release. If you punch this pin incorrectly, you can damage your slide release and you can accidentally affect your slide lock. So be very wary of that. I have to go off camera. Okay, so I'm sorry I had to go off camera, but basically when you punch in the pin, uh, you have to make sure it just has to go past the slide release and the trigger. After you get it, the rest is more like tapping in the, tr in the trigger pin. Um, I, I have to see it with my own eyes. I can't do it without looking at it. So there we go. So that's your frame assembled with the trigger. Uh, notice I did not adjust the tr trigger yet. Oh, I accidentally adjusted the trigger. Oh, well, so basically when I torqued it in, I wasn't paying attention to the position. So there is still a bit of take-up left. So there we go. Uh, so that's your frame more or less assembled. Now assemble your mag well. Now, in the kit, you actually have this grub screw. Originally, in my first video, I mentioned that this grub screw is actually too long. It's actually the right size. And this other screw is the chunk, it's the other uh, is the second uh, chunkiest screw in the kit. And that's the size of the head. The reason why you will know that this is the screw that you need for the magwell is because it's the only screw that fits perfectly into this uh, crevice on the magwell. So first install your magwell insert with the screw side facing down. Install it like so. And simply You will need an Allen key. Now it's very it's worth noting that when you torque in this Allen key, notice that there is a small gap there that the screw might come out of. Okay, don't torque it all the way through, just leave it so it's flush with the magwell. Uh, the magwell insert. The reason why is because you want a bit of play, so then when you cup in your magazine, um, your magwell, you have a little bit of area to work with. So uh, you start with the front, you don't do the back first, because the front has a bit of a shoe. You may notice that I grinded off some area on my frame. Okay, so that's the, that's the magwell assembled. So up to this point of the video, we're just assembling the stuff in the slide, and then you can already put this on your gun, really. So you have a whole bunch of screws here. Um, these two screws, very, very tiny for the battle plate. When you first take your kit out of the slide, um, your kit will not have the screws um, on the battle plate. So you basically have to take it out of the package. They look like that, very, very tiny. So that's two screws that you no longer have to think about. Now the other two screws are exactly identical. They look like that. And those are for your RMR. This is what it looks like, roughly. That's how it works. Um, very, very easy to install, really. It's just two screws. And it's worth noting that when you're torquing down these screws, do not torque them down too tight. If you torque them too tight, you can break the post. So I'm going to warn you right now, do not torque them down too tight. You do not need to. Just you just torque it down until it starts getting a little bit tight, and you can already sort of leave like that. You can give it a quarter turn if you want, uh, which I didn't, because I don't bother. So that's a armor. Now, for the rest of the key stuff, it's actually very simple. So, there's actually one silver screw that goes on top of the piston. This is the piston base. This allows you to install your piston cup. Afterwards, grab this screw. Take your blowback housing unit. Install the piston base. Like so. It should sit in this orientation once you have it properly installed. So... Put the screw at the back over here.
then just start torquing down the screw. Make sure your piston base actually stays still. If it doesn't stay still, you may have to align it. Okay. Now afterwards, you should test if it can move. So it appears to move perfectly fine. So that's there. Now for the rest of the parts, uh, there's only a, one screw for the arm uh, for the uh, suppressor sight. It's the only screw for it, and there's one screw with a blue thread lock for your front iron sight. I already installed that one. Uh, those screws are the easiest ones to identify. That's why I decided to skip the installation because it's just a screw. So go arm or get get that ready. Now here's the tricky part. Uh, you see this silver piece? A lot of people are confused about this. Uh, this is the nozzle spring detent capture. So what happens is that when you have your nozzle spring inside like this, this is what captures it and prevents it from just flying out. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to sit like this on your blowback housing unit. Oops, my bad. It's meant to sit like this. It's very untraditional compared to other slide kits that normally use the extractor to help you hold the detent. It actually uses that to help you hold the detent. So, let's go with the insulation. So take your extractor, put it in. You may need small hands. Or you may need to just be a little bit more careful. There we go. Notice that it's perfectly flush in here, so it's clearly not the thing that's holding the detent spring. Next, grab your nozzle, of course. I already have it in. Grab your detent with the fat side of the detent on the nozzle spring with the thin side sticking out. Put it in like so. Then put your capture on top. Now some people have been following it down the detent. I warn you right now, if you follow it, be very wary. One day it could fly out. especially when the nozzle spring starts losing tension, sometimes it could fly out. So just be very wary of that. Now, after you have all this down, grab your your plate for the rear blow the housing unit. Get all this ready. And you have to slip this whole entire thing into the slide. Now, here's the tricky part. Even though even though this uh, nozzle spring D10 capture will stay, stay, uh, will stay out, you can actually push it in so long as you don't crush the nozzle spring. Crap. And while you're doing that, you have to make sure this extractor stays still. And this is frankly the most annoying part because the extractor does not like to stay still. So you have to insert it like this. Start with the rear, go into the back. And after you get the back seated in, push the rest very slowly into place. Now, up to this point, you basically have this sticking out. What you do is that you maneuver the blowback housing unit a little bit down so you can help you push this into place. So push this very, very slowly. That did not go in correctly. Oh crap, I turned it the wrong way, that's why. So basically this is just a, just a very, very slow game where you just move a piece into position. There we go, I got it. There we go. Take your suppressor height sight.
through screw, which is very, very tiny Allen key, by the way. It's not super tiny, but it's relatively tiny. I hate using small Allen keys. Up to this point, spray build loop. Oh, oh, that's a bit too much. Oops. My bad. Okay, good enough for now. Next, grab your hop-up unit and your barrel. Very sexy looking barrel. And then simply slide your gun into place on your frame. So that's the whole entire gun assembled. Alright guys, so I hope that assembly video was helpful. I don't do assembly videos very often, but uh, hopefully that helped someone out there. And I hope it wasn't too long. But anyways, just to let you guys know, if you assemble this on a Murray frame, it appears to run pretty good albeit a little bit slow, but it appears to run okay. Um, if you're using green gas or if you're in very, very hot weather, uh, be wary, of course, that the Murray spring, the Murray hammer spring may not be able to push the um, the floating valve open. So just be wary of that. It's a very, very common problem. Look it up. Um, so otherwise, it appears to be a drop-in fit. And also, just to let you guys know, um, for those techs who actually know what they're doing, this is a garter frame, um, as I mentioned earlier. You don't need to do much work. I leveled up the frames with shims, and I also polished the frame. And then, and then, by the way, that's all I did. I did nothing to the internals yet. Look at it. It it appears to be doing this all by itself. So everything appears to be perfectly fine. I don't know why this is working better than my other guns modify kits. At least, it, I'm not entirely sure why now. Tell the truth. I level up all my frames on a garden frame. I, I do all that work in general anyways to a frame. But otherwise, the kit seems to be doing pretty good. I'm thinking that maybe they actually bothered doing the quality control on this this time. And actually assembled everything and tested everything before they actually shipped it out. Um, because if it's working this well on a garden frame with just a little bit of leveling. Like, you know, this is actually very, very simple to do. This is with, this is with completely stock with internals with the recoil spring that they gave me. So, pretty straightforward. Very straightforward kit, it appears to be. Um, I hope they make more kits. Just to show you guys, this is with the, still with the stock hammer spring. So be wary, the cycling speed might start slow, and then it picks up speed. This is with no tune-up work. So, like, you can obviously tell this slide is a little bit slow. Uh, like I mentioned, if you do no tune-up work, I do find it to be a little bit slow. I'm purposely showing you guys this because, holy hell, it appears that you can just build it in almost whatever way you want, like pretty much. Um, so I'm very, very happy about that. I'm extremely happy about that. So albeit 2,900 Hong Kong dollars, holy hell, it's worth it because it seems to work. It seems to bloody work. Like, thank fucking God it works. Oh. 2900 bucks still hurts, but by the way, 2900 uh, Hong Kong dollars, not US dollars. If it's US dollars, you might as well be jumping off a building, which don't do it. Okay, so I'm just going to do my own internal work some other time. I might actually just completely leave it alone because it's already moving on its own. Um, this is just for display, so that's quite interesting. Everything seems to work very well. And just to show you guys something, by the way, um, this is how much my barrel has been scratching right there. There's a little bit here. There's also a little bit on the top over here, but the camera's not picking it up very well. Oh, there we go. It appears to be scratching a little bit, but to tell the truth, that's okay. Because um, because it looks, when I look at this from a distance, it looks like it's oil on the top. In fact, let me try to rub that off. 
yeah, appears to be fine. And this is the barrel play. Not very much, a little bit. You, you can clearly hear it. So if, if anything, I w in the future, I may want the barrel to be a little bit tighter, like if they ever made other kits ever again. But this is a very, very minor complaint. Because in general speaking, the hop-up unit still stays still. And uh, as for the rest of the stuff, you know, it's just, you know, whatever you want to do, right? Um, so yeah, very, very happy about the kit. Very satisfied. It's probably the best kit I've ever gotten. Um, could be because the agency arms is fooling me a little bit, but probably the best kit I've ever gotten. Yeah. God damn. And just to let you, let you guys know, if you want to adjust the trigger... Um, you adjust the trigger from the back this time. Uh, normally, guns modify, they require you to adjust the adjustable trigger at the front. Um, you could, you have to do it at the back now. So it works exactly the same as it does before. Very easy to do. Um, if you adjust the trigger by too much, what will happen... Which, by the way, I didn't, I didn't adjust my trigger yet, which is why there's a bit of take-up. That is the take-up. So there's that over travel. So everything's working normally. Okay? Everything works. If you uh, adjust the screw by too much, your trigger reset may not work and your trigger bar may not engage the sear, which is very, very common. If it's it, Every single upgraded trigger with a two double trigger does that. So you just don't adjust it by too much. If I were you, leave that screw out and then adjust it later. So overall, I'm very satisfied with the kit, very happy about it. Like, the only complaint that I had from before in my part 1 video was the appearance of the Cerakote. Don't get me wrong, like, the kit looks great and all. It's just that whenever you, whenever I look at Cerakote, I can clearly see that Cerakoted. And I don't exactly like the general look of it. I love the color that it produces. I love the range of colors that it has. It's just that when you look at Cerakote, you, you can clearly tell that it's Cerakoted. But it has this strange appearance that I don't like. But otherwise, actually, everything is perfectly fine. To be honest, twenty nine hundred Hong Kong dollars and everything works this well with almost no work. I spent more fi more time making the frame than anything else, and this works fantastic. Definitely worth it if you have the money. If you have the means. I highly recommend you to get one. It's probably the only kit that did not piss me off. What pissed me off was making the frame. Frankly, Agency Arms pissed me off because they, like, oh my god, like, how many cuts do you have to do to the bloody frame? Which reminds me, I forgot to do the stupid Comet cut on the, on the magazine release, but I don't think I'm gonna bother because holy hell am I tired. And um, just to let you guys know, I'm using an Ace One Arms RMR. Looks like this. The dot is very crisp on the lowest setting, but um, the glass will still pop out, so just be wary of that. No matter which Airsoft RMR you decide to use, the glass will pop out at some point in time. So up to this point in the video, I will no longer talk about the kit, we'll talk about the stippling and the framework. So just to let you guys know, if you want to do the polishing for all this stuff, let me give you guys a quick tip. If you actually use sandpaper, um, use high grit sandpaper, medium grit sandpaper, and go all the way down to the lowest sand uh, paper, you will basically remove the inconsistencies, and that, but you will still have the color off. The color will appear, appear to be a very sandy color. How I chose to smooth it out, was that I decided to use a metal polishing paste, which you should not use. If you have any other options, use that instead. I chose to use this with a buffing tool or a rag. And afterwards, I just basically uh, wiped it down for a, a good 5 to 10 minutes uh, per side, by the way, and then it produced this. So if you notice, the color is a little bit grayish, but it no longer has that sand texture finished from the sandpaper. So that's what I personally did. Um, afterwards, on one particular side though, because it was still a little bit rough, I did take a little bit of water and sandpaper just to clean that area up. It was actually rather simple to do. If we don't know what I'm talking about, all these kinds of techniques are very, very common. Everyone uses them all the time for other kinds of stuff. If you've built an SEI frame, polishing will be very easy. The cutting will probably be the most annoying part. Um, and for those people who were complaining about me not using a mill, I have a mill. 
is just that my mill is mechanical. And may I remind you, you have to hold the frame like this. Or hold it like this. To do the cut. May I, oh, I'm not exactly sure what kind of platform you guys have. But I'm having trouble imagining a platform that is that big. That can hold the frame still. And not have it go like this as it mills. Um, because the... I'm pretty sure in the real steel world, they must have some sort of special platform to help them support and hold the frame really still as they do the cuts. Um, I'm pretty sure they have a platform like that because, well, I don't have one. So that's the reason why I had to use a clamp and all that stuff, and it still didn't work out that well. So that I used a Dremel tool to do everything here, including the cut for the trigger guard. So that's how I did everything. Um, so it's nothing special, nothing you guys can't do. The last thing I'll leave you is with the note. Uh, on how I did my stippling. So this is the kind of stippling that I do. It's not very good. It's my best attempt to copy uh, agency arms. And this is the stippling head I use. It's not a tool that you can buy. It's a tool that I custom make myself. Um, I have also have several other versions of these too for a Zeftech, for a salient arm style, for other kinds of styles, for Bowie tactical concepts, for innovative gunfire solution. Oh, no, no, no. no. For uh, Boresight Solutions, which I'm not very good at, that's the one I'm trying to practice on because it's very, very hard to do his uh, his uh, magazine relief cut. It's very, very difficult to do that. It's also very difficult to modify the frame uh, because on Airsoft Glocks, the frame's a little bit thinner. Uh, if you compare it to a real Glock frame, the plastic difference in the, in the magazine area is astronomical. At least that's what it looks like. I had a brief moment to examine it and... Uh, back when I was in the States a while ago, and it seemed very different. Anyways, so that's the tool I use. It's nothing special. This is made of steel. As you can see, mine is rusting a little bit. I dipped it in Pegasol to remove all the uh, excess plastic on the top. It's a kind of chemical that you use to clean the crappy oil. Um, I clean the oil off metals using that stuff, and that stuff weakens plastic. It will actually remove the finishing off plastic if you, do, if you rub that stuff on plastic, so be very, very careful when you use that. Um, do not get Pegasol on the frame. If you get it on the frame, you will mess up the frame. Okay. If you don't know what that is, again, don't worry. Um, this part of the video is only for the people who want to build their own frames. And if I didn't say this earlier, I no longer sell this tool because this is just a tool that I use and, my, and that I made myself. Um, if you're interested, though, let me know. I'll compile, start compiling a list and see what I can do. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, please feel free to comment, like, and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page that you can follow me on in which I will leave a link in the description box below. Peace, guys. Happy shooting, and thanks for watching.